countries have been affected by colonization and worldwide globalization. Um, Professor Mufwene will be talking for 45 minutes, so we'll have about 10 minutes for questions at the end. And I'd like to also thank Professor Kathleen Hugh, who has agreed to act as rapporteur for the session. So without any further delay, I'd like to pass on to Professor Mufwene. Permettez-moi de commencer en saluant les Sénégalais. I'd like to start by greeting the Senegalese. I'm very happy to be here because this is one of the rare opportunities I have to talk to Africans here. And also because I am in the uh, country of Sheikh Tajab, this is one of my intellectual heroes because Sheikh Tajab taught us to check scientific assumptions with the available data and he uh, gave us the courage to challenge uh, some of the ideas and this is an, a position I have adopted in my intellectual life. Because it's more practical for me, I don't want to <laughs> bore you with my, my fangle. <laughs> And um, I'll start with uh, the, uh, an attempt to define uh, my understanding of economic development. And uh, very often I like to check with Wikipedia before checking any other source, simply because Wikipedia is more democratic. And for your information, <laughs> one time I was checking the definition of poverty, and I found the character, the definition of poverty in Wikipedia more informative than the definition of poverty in Encyclopedia Britannica, which is more prestigious. In any case, according to Wikipedia, it's the process by which a nation improves the economic, political, and social well-being of its people. And online, I also found the business dictionary and according to them, it is the efforts that seek to improve the economic well-being and quality of life for a community by creating and or retaining jobs and supporting or growing incomes and the tax base. So for me, this also entails something else that is said in the same dictionary, the adoption of new technologies transition from agriculture-based to industry-based economy and general improvement in living standards. And I think what matters the most is general uh, improvement in living standards. However, an important question arises from this characterization and that is whether a productive and modernized uh, agriculture is not part of economic development. A great deal of the process of economic development involves creating jobs and enabling the working age population to be self-reliant, capable of meeting their financial needs and ensuring their well-being. Economic development should enable the working age population to secure adequate homes for their families to have access to sanitation resources, to pay for their health care or to afford it if it is not free, and to afford the schooling of their children and so forth. So it's all, all sorts of things. And I present all this because at some point I'm going to ask whether we should be dwelling so much on language, on schooling, when we want to discuss economic development. And economic development not on, uh, requires not only a population that is willing or is ready to work and companies that want to invest, but also governments that invest in the human capital by building adequate hospitals, sanitation services, urban infrastructures, that is transportation, electricity, running water, and so forth. 
And I included this because you know, everybody has been saying Africa is urbanizing. But the urbanization here has to be interpreted as exodus from the rural areas to the city or to the urban centers. And when you go and observe the urban centers, you get the impression that the urban centers are evolving into mega villages. Don't worry, it may not apply to Dakar. <laughs> But this is my impression, and especially um, those peripheries that are evolving around the original centers where you find the um, square camps and all sorts of shanty houses or unfinished houses in which people are living. And also this government should provide communication and transportation networks that are very critical for the population to be connected, to work together, and so forth. In many places in Sub-Saharan Africa, the reality is still rather grim. More than an average of 55 years of the independence as I will show at the end of my talk, I hope it's really appalling and the poor are becoming impatient. That means that Africa is becoming more and more explosive. It's like a time bomb likely to explode anytime, anywhere. The principal reasons for these conditions lie more in the lack of will, in my opinion, and in misplaced priorities rather than in lack of money. And the economic development of several Asian countries shows that we can't continue to blame the former colonizers and the global north for things that we, do, we Africans don't do. It's difficult to explain where the money comes to build all these things, palaces, impressive stadiums, and other kinds of things that the common people don't benefit from. So providing entertainment to the population is not necessarily contributing to the economic development of a nation. School conditions in sub-Saharan Africa reflect the state of the economic development sometimes regressive in sub-Saharan Africa and in many places this is what it is. We see every now and then pictures of progressive schools and so forth, but when I watch the news about Africa and so forth, the pictures that I see are not those of progressive schools. They are the ones that we Africans would like to hide. I'm sorry, I had now to focus on the side of the poor people that haven't really benefited of the so-called economic growth of Africa, <laughs> which is not shared by most of the populations. And on average, schools are underfunded, understaffed, inadequately equipped, and teachers are not well paid, not even regularly if they are paid, Many students can attend alone, uh, can, cannot attend, let alone finish secondary school because their parents cannot afford them. Or the living conditions are such that they cannot live long enough to stay in school, and they're scandalous. Under these conditions, even monolingual school, a monolingual school system wouldn't be successful. And that's to show language is very often an epiphenomenon. And if we want to improve the conditions of our schools, there are many other issues that we have to address in the first place. The question of medium of education needn't boil down to education in mother tongue, just like one's mother tongue needn't be confused with their parents' languages, because a lot of people debate there are 250 languages spoken in the Congo. Which language is going to be the language of education? There are over 
Some people say 400 languages spoken in Nigeria, which language should one choose? And the requirement or expectation is for a child to be educated in a language that they command well or the best, not necessarily in the mother tongue. It's a matter of being practical. We have to be realistic. The government cannot afford to teach every child in the mother tongue. No government in the world can. A lot of children in Africa grow up multilingual, some indeed with two mother tongues like myself, and even in that case, you have to choose which mother tongue to favor anyway. And the question that arises typically is what is the language that is the most practical for a particular town or region? Realistically, the vast majority of peoples, uh, I'm sorry, realistically, for the vast majority of peoples, that language shouldn't be the European official language although this has been the most lucrative. And the fact that the European language is the one that guarantees better income is already a problem in itself. It's like Africa is working for Europe instead of working for Africa itself. Ironically, the European official language functions as the medium of education in secondary schools and in higher education. White collar jobs which require command of the same language are few, but they also disenfranchise the majority. Numerous are citizens who need interpreters in dealing with the government. That in itself is a problem in your own country, your administrators, the people that run your country cannot talk to you in a language that you know. And you have to need an interpreter to make your case in court. You need an interpreter to get a birth certificate. You need an interpreter for this service and that service. And it's only the system at the very bottom of the administration that um, uh, operates in the indigenous language. So, does the solution lie in starting to teach the European official language early in the school system? Or does it lie in changing the language regimes? That is, in making indigenous languages the media of education from elementary school to higher education and have all the white collar jobs function in the same indigenous languages. Here is a grim situation. It's been over 55 years since Africa became independent. In principle, the rate of scholarization has increased. There are more and more children that attend school. And these children are getting at least high school education in the European language. But what is the proportion? of Africans that speak those European languages fluently. It is estimated that it fluctuates between 20 and 30 percent. Somebody is wasting somebody else's time. Somebody is wasting the resources of a nation. And there are good reasons why a lot of us Africans don't become fluent speakers of these European languages. First of all, because we don't need them for socialization. Another reason is that there aren't enough jobs where we would practice them anyway. So in the end, we learn French and English like we learn geography and what, algebra and so forth. You get your degree, you can leave it behind because you don't need it. And these are the kinds of things that we have to think about. So what I'm proposing is a global solution that is very national. It can work if there is true economic development and if there is true national integration. In other words, you don't need a common language to be nationally integrated. It's the theory of the pie. If you have to split it into so many small portions, then you're going to fight because somebody is getting too little. <laughs> 
but if you regulate things otherwise, then nobody is going to fight. <laughs> so in other words, you have to get a good economic system in place and people are going to forget about language. Of course, there's the problem of corruption, but that's not what I'm going to discuss today. Okay. Having schools and all sectors of the economy function in indigenous languages doesn't entail adopting the Western national monolingualism. We don't have to subscribe to the ideology of one nation, one language. Multilingualism has had a long history in sub-Saharan Africa. It is colonialism and its post-colonial legacy that have wanted to make it an issue. It's because people are dodging addressing the problem of economic development independent of language. On the other hand, the colonial period also fostered the emergence of indigenous urban vernaculars and regional lingua francas, which have generally been accepted as the ethnicized. We worry about where a Wolof is the language of the Wolof people only, but urban Wolof isn't really like ethnic Wolof. Town Bemba is not like Chibemba. <laughs> Chikongo Kituba is very different from ethnic Chikongo. <laughs> I speak Chikongo Kituba natively, I don't understand any variety of ethnic Kikongo, it's just another language for me. So these are the kinds of things that we have to bear in mind. And these, um, these uh, regional languages or local lingua francas appear to be the right choices, assuming that the school system prepares pupils and students to function in the national socioeconomic structures. We shouldn't be preparing our students to function in the Euro European socioeconomic system. It's been tried, and here, with all the French that I had learned in the Congo, I arrived in Paris, I cannot uh, what name the food items in a restaurant in Paris, and somebody is still going to ask me, where is that accent from, okay? <laughs> And I have spoken to the French with vengeance too by telling them they should learn my language if they come to my country. <laughs> Favoring indigenous languages doesn't entail rejecting European languages either. Although accepting the letter needn't privilege the language of the former colonizer. We want to be in contact with the rest of the world but we don't want foreign languages to have top, a top position in our homelands, just in the same way that our indigenous languages don't occupy a privileged position in European or uh, societies or Western societies in general. We know there's a matter of economic power here and so forth, but we have to strive for economic power. It is simply rating the usefulness of indigenous languages for national internal use over non-indigenous languages. It's like if Yoruba isn't going to be a highly rated language in Senegal, then French shouldn't be a highly rated language in Senegal then English shouldn't be a privileged language in Ghana and so forth. It is assigning to European colonial languages the position that is the most natural for them. That is a useful language for communication with the outside world, but not for business at home. It is empowering, this is an act, a request to empower indigenous languages in all sectors of African lives at home, vice, namely academically, economically, politically, and so forth. So maybe we should be hearing more indigenous languages in African parliaments. Okay. 
It is empowering indigenous languages in, okay, I think I said, it is encouraging outsiders to learn the local languages in order to communicate with the natives instead of forcing the natives to accommodate outsiders. I'm sorry. How many African ambassadors do, are not required to learn the languages of the countries in which they represent their countries? <laughs> And how often has it been that the ambassador, the European ambassador, the American ambassador in your country doesn't understand a single word of your lingua franca? <laughs> Why isn't it a requirement? Competence in foreign languages shouldn't be a prerequisite for success within one's own country. Then arises the perennial issue of whether the indigenous languages have adequate terminologies in domains associated with the expansion of their functions, that is, the functions of these languages in science, technology, public administration, and so forth. This was a question when French became a national language of France and had to take the place of Latin. European countries went through this and so forth. But for some reason, we thought that we shouldn't do this with indigenous languages. Well, the onus is on experts in these domains to develop the suitable terminologies, though it may take a while before they are standardized. We have to start somewhere. The enterprise must be global in the sense of being comprehensive, not necessarily worldwide. Uh, in order to eliminate a system that has rated competence in European languages over competence in indigenous languages, knowledge of foreign languages will still be encouraged. But for those who wish or have to interact with the outside world, students will be given a choice between global languages and languages of neighboring countries like elsewhere around the world. This is a political problem in the United States, leaving the podium for your glass, <laughs> your water. <laughs> I'm advocating leveling the playing field nationally and internationally. If economic development entails improving the welfare of the citizens of a nation by enabling them to meet their economic needs, then it must start by reducing disparities in opportunities that are available to the citizens. More citizens will be, will be or feel less disadvantaged in, uh, in school and at the job market if the schools operate in indigenous rather than in foreign languages in which they are less likely to develop acceptable fluency especially if they don't socialize in them. There is a joke circulating in the Congo now. And the joke is the children of the Minister of Education attend school abroad. <laughs> the Minister of Health goes abroad for health care. <laughs> and the Minister of Housing and so forth has his best house outside the country. <laughs> Something is wrong, isn't it? <laughs> Schools cont contribute to economic development in preparing citizens to participate in the economy. But schools will realize their mission better in an economy that supports them and meets their needs. In other words, the state shouldn't wait for schools to produce the right workforce for the industry. The state should invest in the national human capital, the children, as one of the sector and, uh, and the schools as one of the sectors of the economic system, starting apparently with well-paying jobs that do not require much academic training, just like during the colonial period. I talked to somebody yesterday because I struggled between the colonial period and the post-colonial period. <laughs> And during the colonial period, most of the jobs that were developed were blue-collar jobs. And these are the jobs that 
enable people like my father to send me to the boarding school, they could afford them, they could make sacrifices. And of course, the cost should be relative to what the citizens can afford. You don't want to make the cost prohibitive to students, otherwise, to, to the citizens, otherwise what you have to do is simply subsidize education. And it's that kind of subsidizing that enabled me to attend college, otherwise I wouldn't have been college material. <laughs> So there are a number of things that are the responsibility of the state and the state shouldn't be dodging these responsibilities. I uh, had an, es an escapade to town uh, at lunchtime and in the taxi uh, they were reporting about uh, President Macron in uh, Burkina Faso and uh, one of the things he said is Africa is the place where French is going to become a strong language and so forth. Okay, and then after this, a student was asking a question, and this too was startling because the student was asking why France isn't giving as many fellowships or scholarships to Burkina Faso as it is making the troops, French troops available in Burkina Faso? That's a very good question, but there's something shocking. Why should Africa be waiting for scholarships from France instead of Africa making available scholarships to African students and so forth? So it's, there's a culture of dependency that is, you know, continuing, that has been fostered, and that should be questioned. I must, and the government must, must invest in the infrastructure and adequate staffing of schools. In other words, instead of the pictures I showed you earlier, we should be seeing more of pictures like this. I have deliberately not selected the pictures that represent the upper crust of the population because that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the kinds of things that the population can afford. It should be fine for a student to pupil to leave class and go somewhere where they are going to have decent housing, where they have um, a place where they can read and so forth. We should be in a situation where the students are not, you know, bunched next to each other without space to, you know, be comfortable. We should be in a situation where there is some sort of library where students uh, can uh, read uh, in free time, and this is not asking for too much of our governments. I'm sorry, I didn't come here to foster rebel instigate rebellion. I'm just causing you to, <laughs> prompting you to think. <laughs> the state must reward academic training in indigenous languages in making sure that its own institutions or departments and all sectors of the economy function in indigenous languages. It must make sure that those that do not know European here is something. Very often we want to start with education in indigenous languages at elementary school. Well, high school is operating in the European language and the university is operating in the European language and the best paying jobs are operating in some version of the European language. I'm sorry for putting it that way. <laughs> So, which parent would be stupid enough to say my child is going to be educated only in the uh, indigenous language and not in the European language when they realize that there is no reward at the end of the tunnel? <laughs> okay. Multilingualism is pervasive in Africa. Can the state realistically invest in all the indigenous languages, both in schools and in the economy? To be sure, even the wealthiest countries in the world couldn't afford to provide schooling in all the languages spoken by their citizens. Such a policy or practice 
may also reduce geographical mobility for citizenships. We don't want to force the citizens to just remain where they were born and not be able to move. However, there are some languages in place that serve as lingua francas and are somewhat de-ethnicized. And the, 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 the ethnicization preempts the potential to favor some particular ethnic groups, an excuse that has traditionally been adduced to maintain schooling in European languages. Modern states have implemented mass education because it provides literacy to their citizens. Literacy provides access to various knowledge and enables citizens to function competitively in economic systems that depend on written information in all sectors. That knowledge is transmitted or acquired more reliably in a language that the workforce understands the most easily, their own vernacular or lingua franca. Given the condition of European languages in Africa today for those that learn them in school but don't practice them, how can you trust a workforce that receives these direct, the, the instructions in French or in English or in Portuguese and they don't interpret Portuguese or French or English faithfully and they have to do the job. I'd rather buy a Chinese product. It is on this ground that experts have argued that economy can function the best in indigenous languages. A literate workforce will certainly make it easier for the economy to modernize and evolve beyond farming. Modernized farming itself requires some literacy, which is more critical for planning and bookkeeping. It is actually activities like this, planning, bookkeeping, that fostered the emergence of writing in human civilizations some 5,000 years ago. And we should stick to that, it makes sense. There is no excuse for sub-Saharan Africa not to have narrowed the north-south divide over 55 years since independence. And Malaysia made me cry in embarrassment. In 2001, I was in Singapore and I decided to visit Malaysia. And we were driving in a very modern highway and on the sides of the highway were heavier plantations, palm oil plantations. And these are the companies that left the Congo in the 1960s because the Congolese system wasn't supporting them adequately. And you compare Malaysia to the Congo, it's really a growing difference with Malaysia becoming a what, an emergent nation and the Congo regressing. I don't know whether it is still a third world country, but these are the kinds of things that you find in many places in Africa. And it is depressing when you travel and people ask you, how is it in your home country? Economic development can start with blue collar jobs, just like in the colonial period, as long as the workforce is financially empowered. Schools are not a prerequisite to economic development. However, economic development will proceed faster and more globally if schools are included in the economic development endeavor. African indigenous languages should be part of the economic development plan which in the spirit of democracy must be more inclusive. The linguistic indigenization or Africanization of schools and administration or gov and governments should start globally including all levels and all sectors at the same time. No longer the trick of starting at the elementary school and you think if things work, will change the secondary school, and if things work, will change things at the university. Guess what? In some places, this has been done for the past 50 years, and nothing more has happened, because we are still, sorry to have to say it, intellectually enslaved. 
and that's not the way we should be. I mentioned Che Kanta Job at the beginning. It's not by accident that I use such provocative language. And there is still room for foreign languages, but not at the expense of indigenous ones. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so we've got about 10 minutes for uh, questions. We'll take maybe three questions, and then um, Professor Mafwini can answer them. If I could ask you to put your hand up if you've got a question, and to speak clearly, and start with your name so we know who you are. Does anyone have any questions? There's one there. One there. Can we start with Friederike over here, and this gentleman over here? Uh, thank you very much for this thought-provoking uh, presentation. I agree with about 99% of what you said, but I have a tiny little hint of a doubt regarding the de-ethnization of lingua francas and their usability as uh, languages that will not cause conflicts. And just because we are in Senegal, I will take the example of Wolof. From a practical point of view, it would make complete sense to introduce Wolof on the entire territory of Senegal. However, Senegal is recovering from a secessionist conflict with its southern part, the Casamance. And while many people in the Casamance speak Wolof, there's a huge ambivalence towards Wolof as the language of the north. It's a language that is seen as associated with colonization because it's bred through the colonial administration and is still seen as the language of a northern elite. So introducing Wolof as a compulsory medium of instruction would actually cause huge political tensions and might actually re uh, initiate the, the, the civil war. And the same holds for many seemingly de-ethnicized languages across board. We, we see people are talking about a new Biafra conflict in Nigeria um, because of linguistic, linguistically interpreted clashes. So I, ha I wonder how useful that is, and that is somehow a, a little spanner in the works of your otherwise really great plan. So I wonder if you have any thoughts on that. Thank you. And this gentleman here? Um, this, this gentleman in blue here. Voilà. Merci. Deux questions. Thank you. Two questions. Number one. Professor, you're right to say that education in African languages is useful, and that's true. But Africa is faced with the resistance, as I may call it, of governments. According to you, what should we do to convince African governments? of uh, this simple truth that you have just uh, so clearly expounded, that the languages of our countries not only ensure good governance, generalized information, um, full literacy, which are the basis of economic growth. Why, uh, I mean, how can we convince uh, African governments of this basic truth? That's our problem. Thank you. Third question here? Yeah, just this person here, and then we'll pass to you. Oh, thank you, Professor. Uh, I think you have disturbed us very much. But probably this is, this is the kind of disturbances that we sometimes need to wake up to the realities of life. I have one question, however. You said something very strongly. 
the playing fields should be leveled nationally and internationally. Yes, I wish for that to happen. But uh, I wonder whether that is foreseeable, at least in my lifetime. Uh, colonization, as someone said, is something very pernicious. You're not only fighting against the colonizer, but sometimes you need to fight against yourself as a colonized person. That's for the national level. Uh, as for the international level, uh, <coughs> you know, who is it going to be against? Europe, which is now finding itself under attack from America with Trump. <laughs> do, do you see what I'm trying to suggest? So, you know, the, 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 the problem, the solution, is in my sense very difficult, you know, leveling the playing field. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Hey. I, I thank you for all these questions, and they are very realistic questions, and this is where um, academia is confronted to reality in the world. Uh, it's easy, I talked to a minister yesterday, it's easy to propose all these solutions, and you have some office, and you have to deal with reality. Well, the problem, I mean, um, coming back to where, you know, Wolof should be dealing with. Well, I spoke of indigenous languages, but not for, uh, I didn't argue for monolingualism. <laughs> you know, you have to leave room for regional variation. It would be unfair to impose one language over everybody. But there are languages that emerge as regional lingua francas, like in the Congo, we count four of them. There might even be more, I don't know. And here in Wolof, I'm not going to take any position because I don't know Senegal. I mean, I'm here in Senegal. Uh, regarding Wolof, I won't take any position because I don't know the reality of Senegal. Uh, but this is something that the nationals should try to resolve. They have to face that question. It's like a choice between two evils. Do you want to keep the status quo that marginalizes and disenfranchises the overwhelming majority or do we need do we want a situation where we kind of reduce the problem by empowering more people in the workforce and in the economic system that's all I'm proposing there is no perfect system in these kinds of things in English, we speak of satisfying solution and not satisfactory solution. There won't be a solution that is satisfactory for all. But there should be some solutions that are satisfying and can resolve some of the problems. That's all I'm proposing. <laughs> um, about the resistance of governments. Well, yes, uh, au sujet de la résistance des gouvernements. And the resistance on government, it's true that there is resistance from government. If I were in a position where my interests would be the most protected by the status quo, I would probably be in the same position as government. I would not budge. Uh, but the situation is such that we are currently promoting democracy and we want to be independent um, countries, etc. And all I can say is that it is time for the uh, people to be committed into the system. And it is time that the status quo be put into question. Maybe we could then convince our governments um, to think otherwise. Um, in most cases, and I would cite the example of my country, the Congo, um, we have a government which wants to remain in power and has uh, done nothing for the past 30 years or so. But the system wants to perpetuate itself in power. And um, I mean, listen, you need to uh, have something positive to show in order to give your position, you know. I would not have a problem if we had a king working for the people, you know. 
but I think that um, all that means is that um, the problems that uh, we have devoted the most attention to, including languages, schooling, these are not the real issues for economic development. The problem is elsewhere. Of course, these are relevant factors, but they are not the most important ones for economic development the way I see it. That's all I can tell you. National integration. Vous voulez que je réponde en français plutôt? <laughs> la, la question de l'intégration nationale. Question of national integration and uh, uh, relation with the outside world. I mean, these are things that we need to negotiate. Um, I um, gave the example of a piece of pie. Um, when the interests of people, uh, when people's interests are not well represented, then you. Um, fight uh, for your share of the pie, as they say. But if uh, people's interests are well represented, then each one waits for their own turn and wait to play their part. I uh, had an experiment with my cats. I have four cats at home. And the first time I gave them the treat, um, the first cat uh, didn't want to share with the others and wanted to have it all to itself. Now I took four bowls and I put them side by side. Each one of them had their share. And the more I do that, you know, when I start serving the first one, the others wait in line and know that they will have their turn and know that they'll have their share. But before that, they didn't know that there was enough to go around, so they were finding it over it. So even animals learn about that. <laughs> So um, the problem is how do we uh, go about solving this uh, type of problems? And the example will still be coming from Asia. I'm not saying that all Asian countries are uh, in a better condition than Africans, but I think there are good examples in Asia that we should emulate. And what is happening in Asia, uh, I think is here in the room, um, more and more Asian countries are teaching uh, their population in Asian languages. They are managing their government affairs in Asian languages. And European languages uh, become additional tools in the toolbox, you know, to communicate with the outside world. Uh, we often talk uh, about selling our goods abroad. Well, you go to Japan, you know, everything is labeled, in, in, is produced in Japanese and then it is sold in English to the outside world. You think the Americans would not do the same? I mean, they gave us the example at the University of Chicago. I see uh, business school teachers who are learning foreign languages in order to communicate with the outside world. And uh, American businesses at a higher level are uh, multilingual, you know, they are managed by multilingual people because they don't want to end up in international gatherings without knowing what is going on and what people are talking about and they don't want to rely on interpreters. Um, but in the United States everything is done in English, in China everything is done in Chinese, in Japan everything is done in Japanese, etc, etc. I think that these are good models uh, for us and the Europeans or the Westerners would have no reason to impose this system on us, a system that would run counter to what they practice at home. Okay, I think we've got time for one more question. Um, let's choose someone at the back, perhaps uh, this gentleman over there. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you for giving me the floor. My name is Serinjai from Senegal. I can't hear you, sorry. My name is Serinjai from Senegal. Uh, first of all, allow me to thank the professor for his brilliant uh, and relevant presentation. Um, very informative. Um, I was most um, impressed with the part where he spoke about um, advocacy of uh, African languages, but that doesn't mean rejection of foreign languages or Western languages. Somebody also 
ask the question as to what we should do to convince African leaders so that uh, they be aware of the significance uh, of African languages. I think that we should reword that question and ask it otherwise. We should ask 